Hello everyone and welcome to the part two video for my monthly gaming PC build for March 2022. I already built this system in the initial video and now I'm gonna be testing it to show the performance. How hot do the components inside get? Continuing to show off this build's general sexiness since it's built in the brand new Height Y60 case, the white and black version of that. And even though it's not playing out exactly as I planned in the planning video for this build at the very beginning of March, yes, this system is also up for giveaway. Excellent! Today's video was brought to you by the Corsair K70 RGB Pro Mechanical Gaming Keyboard, powered by Axon Processing Technology and Genuine Cherry MX Mechanical Switches. This board packs its aluminum frame with features like dynamic per-key RGB lighting, a detachable USB Type-C cable, durable PBT double-shot keycaps, and IQ software support on both PC and Mac OS. You also get dedicated media keys, a multi-function volume roller, onboard storage for up to 50 profiles and more. So for further details on the Corsair K70 RGB Pro, click the sponsor link in the video description. A few things to mention right from the start today. Big, big, and many thanks to Asus for providing the graphics card, the Asus ROG Strix RTX 3080 Ti LC or liquid cooled variant of that GPU, as well as the Asus ROG Strix Z690-E gaming Wi-Fi motherboard. Thank you as well to G-Skill for providing the Trident Z5 RGB DDR5 memory kit that we're using. And of course, many thanks as well to iBuyPower for providing not just the Height Y60 case that we built in, but also the Intel Core i7 12700K 12th Gen CPU that we're running today, the Deepcool Castle 360EX all-in-one liquid cooler, our storage configuration with SSDs from WD and Samsung, and the Corsair QL120 fans that uh, really finished off the look of this build. And yes, this system is being given away and entries are open now. You can find a gleam.io entry link in the video's description down below. All you have to do is visit my YouTube channel and provide your email address. The only thing I have to apologize for here is that it's only available to US and Canada. The reasons for that are purely economic. It's going to cost me several hundred dollars to ship this system to the US or Canada. But if I were to attempt to ship a system that costs four or five thousand dollars up front anywhere besides that, it would cost me several thousand dollars to do. And I'm sorry, I just, I can't fork out that much money. So my apologies to my international viewers. But that's just how I have to arrange things sometimes if I want to do a giveaway at all. That said, let's dive into some testing, starting out with some temperature tests. So right out of the gate, the first thing we want to test is temperatures. And to do that, I'm running the Ida 6 64 system stability test. That puts a significant 100% load on the CPU, the FPU, the cache, system memory, and we're also using it to stress test the GPU. It's been running for more than 15 minutes now, so the temperatures have started to level out. I should point out that before I ran this test, I did set up the system. So I did the latest UEFI or BIOS update from ASUS. I installed the latest chipset and GPU drivers. We are running Windows 11 and we've done all the most recent updates for that. And I plugged in the memory XMP settings for the kit that we're running. Everything else is set to auto. To stress test this system, we are running the IDA64 system stability test and it's been running for over 17 minutes now and the temperatures have pretty much leveled out. This is putting a 100% load on the CPU, the FPU, the cache, system memory, as well as the GPU. Bear in mind that the 12700K has the same amount of P cores or performance cores as the 12900K. That's eight of them to be precise, and they are running at 4.7 gigahertz across all cores when it's under 100% load. We also have four E cores, and those are running at 3.6 gigahertz. The CPU voltage maxed out at about 1.32 volts. However, it is typically running at closer to 1.15 to 1.17 volts. CPU package power is also also running at just about Intel spec, which is 130 watts. It's uh, fluctuating between about 131 to 134.5 max. And then we have temperatures for the CPU down here. We did peak at 86 degrees Celsius. Bear in mind, again, this is a 100% stress test full load. So rarely see usage like this uh, with typical day-to-day -day use or gaming. That said, it did take the system a while to warm up to these temperatures. We we're initially seeing temperatures closer to 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, but because we're using all-in-one liquid coolers, it takes longer with an AIO for the liquid and the radiator to raise up to its specific temperature and level out. But as you can see here, 86 is a peak and we're actually running it closer to maybe 65 to 75 to 78 degrees Celsius if we're just looking at a spot temperature for any given core. Meanwhile, our ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3080 Ti LC is performing quite admirably, uh, hitting a peak temperature of 63 degrees Celsius. It's running at a peak frequency of 2010 megahertz, but typically closer to 1965 to 1995. It is a power hungry GPU. We can see that by the GPU power measurement 
here, hitting a peak of just shy of 400 watts of power draw. So very happy that we're using a solid 850 watt power supply for this build. And a nice indication that we're getting plenty of airflow to the side mounted 240 millimeter radiator for this card is that initially the peak temperatures were only about 61 to 62 degrees Celsius. And even as the entire system has warmed up with that stress test running, it's only risen by another degree or two hitting 63.1 max. Likewise, the hotspot temperature is perfectly fine at 71.6 degrees Celsius. And even the GPU memory junction temperature, which has been an issue for the GDDR6X memory modules that cards like the 3080 Ti and 3090 run, those can often get really hot hitting 90 degrees Celsius or more. So it's a testament to the design work that Asus put into this card. The radiator on the side mount is doing most of the heavy lifting to keep the GPU cooled. But note that there's an active cooling fan on the card itself, and that's helping keep other components cool, like the power delivery and the memory. So now that we have a good idea of what kind of temperatures we're seeing in this system under a full stress test environment, we can move on to some more specific performance. We're gonna start off by looking at the CPU, and I'm using Cinebench R23 just to give an idea of relative CPU performance. So first off, I just ran the single core and the multi-threaded versions of the test. Our single core score was 1851. Our multi-threaded score was 22,083. And after running multiple tests, all the scores were within that same general ballpark. What I would usually do next, at least with these more recent Intel platforms, is to go into the motherboard's UEFI or BIOS and try to disable some of the automatic limitations that Intel puts in place, such as the power limits, the amount of wattage that the CPU can use for a given time before it drops down to a lower limit. Asus has a feature in their boards called multi-core enhancements and enabling that will basically disable power limits. So I checked the UEFI and it turns out that was set to auto. So going back and rerunning Cinebench let me know that actually I'm already running with those power limits disabled. And the Cinebench multi-threaded score reflected that. It's still in the uh, 21,500 to 22,000 range. But because my initial tests showed that my core temperatures were only hitting 60 to 70 degrees, maybe topping out at 80 degrees after a lengthy stress test, that shows that I do have potentially a little bit of headroom. So I wanted to at least dip my toe into some overclocking for today to show you guys a bit of an AB performance comparison. And for that, we're using Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility, which allows you to do some overclocking from within Windows, which can be pretty convenient. There are multiple ways to overclock and lots more tuning and tweaking can be done, of course, but for today, I just wanted to show you guys really quickly what you can do with pretty minimal effort. By the way, the Extreme Tuning Utility pulls up a quick system info chart right here. I do want to point out that the memory I installed in the build video was DDR5 6000 speed, because that's my memory that I already had here. The memory intended for the build has arrived in the meantime, though, that's DDR5 5600. So it's only slightly slower, and it's still a 400 dollar kit of DDR5 memory, but I know someone is going to call me out in the comment section for that. So I wanted to point that out. The quickest and easiest way to overclock an Intel 12th gen core system is this right here, this optimize now button. But before we click that, let's uh, quickly run the XTU2 benchmark to see a performance comparison with this utility. I will also run Cinemesh to give you guys a before and after comparison as well, but this should be done in just a second. All right, 7635. So now we're just going to click this big optimize now button. And of course we agree to this one. Warning. We agreed to all the warnings. Look at that, just as expected. Uh, the optimize now button pretty much will always give you a 100 megahertz overclock, which is a modest overclock, but it is an overclock nonetheless. We will run that benchmark once again. Over here on Hardware Info, we can see that all of our cores are now at 4.8 gigahertz instead of 4.7 gigahertz, so that's cool. We're also running at roughly the same voltage, so that's nice too. We're not necessarily drawing much more power from this. And in case you're wondering, that score is about a 2.5% improvement from before. Uh, which again, modest improvement, but look how easy it was. I just had to click that button. And by the way, you can click it one more time to turn it off. And just to validate, we're gonna run Cinebench R23, the multi-core test one more time. The uh, single core test shouldn't be affected by this overclock because it's not affecting the maximum frequency that a single core can run at. That's still gonna be five gigahertz with the current configuration. But we should see maybe another 2.5% improvement in our Cinebench score once that spits out. And there we are, 22,990. And hey, in Cinebench, we have a 4.1% boost uh, in our score, so that's, that's pretty cool too. Free performance, that's nice. Although I will note that our core temperatures did creep up a little bit, hitting 85 degrees Celsius after that quick test, which is a bit warmer than it got without the overclock, especially if you look at the beginning of the stress test that I ran. So let's see if this works. I've just done a very slight voltage offset. And by the way, that uh, speed optimizer did do a 0.015 volt offset. We're uh, just bumping that up to 0.025. We can verify here as well that the uh, ICC max is set to unlimited as well as the uh, short and long power boost, as well as our turbo boost limits. Also 
also set to unlimited. We're just gonna go to the active core tuning down here. And basically I'm setting a 5.3 gigahertz overclock on one or two cores, 5.2 gigahertz on up to four cores, 5.1 gigahertz on six cores, and five gigahertz on all cores. Oh, I should also point out that I uh, did a slight overclock 300 megahertz on the efficiency cores as well. So they'll be running at 4.1 gigahertz instead of 3.8. And now we shall run the XTU2 benchmark again. We can see over here we're at five gigahertz across all cores and 4.1 gigahertz on the efficiency cores. So that's looking pretty good. Voltage is a little bit higher at 1.3 volts and our package power is up over 200 watts, 212 to 213. So that's a pretty significant boost as well. But check it out, we got another increased score on our XTU2 bench up to 8048, but I'm guessing that we might see even better results with Cinebench. So let's start off with a multi-core test. Yeah, that package power is definitely higher, 200 to 225 watts. So that's why uh, a 360 millimeter all-in-one cooler is probably a good idea for a configuration like this, especially if you're gonna dive into overclocking. Ah, oh, and we crashed. Oh, we also got way too hot. Well then, uh, I could try dialing back that voltage offset. I mean, it was still getting pretty... Try that one more time. Actually hitting 5.1 and 5.2, but yes, very, very hot right off the bat, hitting 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. And this is why, uh, you know, overclocking headroom on these chips is a bit limited. You kind of want to stay within a pocket to keep yourself from getting too hot too quickly. It looks like we even had a little bit of thermal throttling, so that is a bit of a concern as well, although we're still mostly sticking to that five gigahertz all-core overclock. And here again, we have an improved result, 23138. So let's run these single core tests and see if we uh, are hitting 5.3 gigahertz uh, on a single core, one or two cores is what we should be at. I'm seeing 5.2. Hey, there's 5.3. I knew we could do it. So I did have a system lockup with that overclock that I had set, so I've adjusted a few things. If you want things to run cooler, the easiest way is to use less voltage. Right now we're doing a positive voltage offset. I've dialed that all the way back to 0.01. And then for our frequency overclock, uh, we're at 5.2 gigahertz on the single core. Actually up to three cores, it'll do 5.2 gigahertz, uh, 5.1 gigahertz up to six cores, five gigahertz for all cores. The E-core overclock is also still in effect, and I found that with uh, running the multi-threaded Cinebench test and that setup, we we're still hitting over 100 degrees Celsius on the P-cores, so that was resulting in a little bit of throttling as well. We still got a multi-core score of 23,079, which is just slightly down from the best multi-core score we got, which was 23,138, which is about 4.7% better than our initial multi-threaded score. Likewise, we hit 8,157 marks on the XTU2 bench, and that's about 6.8% faster. And then we got through our single core uh, Cinebench R23 run with a score of 1,980, and that is about 7% faster. The one last thing I wanted to try was a negative voltage offset, just, just to see, just to see what might happen. So we'll go minus 0 0.015 instead of the plus 0 0.015 that uh, it did for us automatically when we did the speed optimizer leaving all the rest of the cores at the same setting as they were before. And let's see what happens with, the, with Cinebench. See if we run into instability. It's at five gigahertz across all cores. We're uh, at 1.26 volts or so, about 220 watts, uh, 222 watts on CPU package power. Still getting pretty warm, still hitting 100 degrees on at least our, our P core number five. That does appear to be our hottest core, still uh, triggering some thermal throttling. So we're not exactly out of the woods in terms of temperatures by doing that negative voltage offset, but it totally helped, 23,694. I think we should probably move on. My top Cinebench R23 multi-thread score was 23,694, and that was with the minus 0 0.015 voltage offset. At this point, I think we should move on to some game testing, and for that, we're gonna play some video games. Oh! And our first game is Minecraft, which always starts with punching some trees, of course. Uh, Man, they've really improved the graphics in this game, though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I almost had you guys there. This is God of War. That's a big tree. Oh, I get to carry the tree. All right. Right, so God of War, I have n not played this game at all. I have very minimal experience with some of the previous entries in the series. We're currently playing with the Ultra preset. We're at 4K resolution, 3840 by 2160. Do note there is a 120 frames per second limit on this game. And at least to start off, we're not running with the LSS or Fidelity FX Super Resolution turned on. We're just showing you the raw performance of this game. And that performance is available in the top left corner of the screen via that overlay where you can see uh, the GPU stats such as the frequency it's running at, the amount of power that's being drawn. 
the amount of memory that's being used, some CPU stats as well, and then of course D3, D11 is going to be the frame rate. Right now we're at 83 frames per second in this beginning part of the game. Since we are running an NVIDIA RTX 3080 Ti, we can use DLSS, Deep Learning Super Sampling, and see what kind of uh, boost that gets us. We can try Ultra or Performance. So Ultra Performance will render at 720 and then upscale to 4K. Performance renders at 1080, upscales to 4K, and Balanced renders uh, something in the middle and then upscales. Oh, and it also tells you how much memory those are gonna take up depending on what you use. Uh, Let's try balanced, that seems reasonable. So right away we see a decent bump up in frame rate, a good 20 to 30 frames per second. We're now hovering above 100. And uh, you guys, you should bear in mind, we are playing this game on the system. I'm capturing this game in 4K on a separate system, so that shouldn't affect performance at all. But let me know if you guys can tell any difference in the quality. I would say it still looks quite 4K to me. Although honestly, it's hard to say because like I said, this is my first time playing this game. Um, but right out of the gate, you know, I'd, I'd say it's looking pretty nice. Let's try the quality preset. That just upscales from 1440. Let's see if there's any noticeable difference there. I'm gonna say yes. Yes, there is. And I'm just noticing, looking at those uh, sort of slanted posts, as I switched to the quality DLSS setting, and what I was looking at was the edges of these sticks right here, which is sort of coming up at an angle. And there I would say I noticed a difference going from the balanced up to the quality setting. It looks a little bit sharper, a little bit more detailed. And obviously I'd love to help the little boy find some deer to kill and stuff like that, but uh, we need to move on to the next game. Next up we're playing Dirt 5. Why? I wanted to include a racing game, but uh, let's take a look at the settings really quick. We're using the ultra high image quality preset. We have turned resolution scaling and VSync off and we are running at the native resolution of 4K. All of those settings could be adjusted to give us more frame rate if we wanted. Right off the bat, we are hitting about 90 to 100, actually a little bit above 100 frames per second. So that's not too bad. All right, I've got myself up into third place. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, now I'm in second. I, sorry, just trying to crack first. I'm really, I should break from time to time, but I'm just ignoring all that. Um, oh, I won, look at that. Look at that! I won! Is it due to my prowess at playing the game and being like an awesome racer? Is it because this computer is so super awesome? Is it because I set the difficulty to easy? I could have done super easy, so that wasn't like... It's easy. RGB. Yeah, probably the RGB. And now, Elden Ring. The game that everyone is playing because it's popular, so we're gonna play it too. <laughs> oh look, here we go. I can move around, I can run, I can do all this good stuff. And one of the things that I thought I would encounter with this game is that there's a 60 frames per second limit, 60 FPS frame cap on this game. So one of the things I thought when I loaded it up was perhaps this system with the RTX 3080 Ti is too powerful, is more powerful than the Elden Ring itself. But the point is 60 FPS right here, right now, that's what we're getting. Uh, I am noticing some tearing here and that's because I went and manually turned off V-Sync in the NVIDIA control panel because uh, that's, there's no control for that in the game itself. So you have to do that at the global level, um, although it hasn't really affected much because we're still maxing out the frame rate at 60 FPS. I don't think I showed this either though. Uh, we're at 4K resolution and we are at the maximum quality settings. In fact, there's no way for us to turn anything up beyond this. Therefore, I must uh, come to the conclusion that this system dominates Elden Ring. And obviously, if you're having any difficulty playing Elden Ring, it's not because it's a really difficult and challenging game to play or that you suck. It's that, uh, you know, you need a system like this to really give you the, the best experience possible. Except for that tearing happening in the middle there, but it's okay. We can turn off VSync to fix that. Oh, what's that? Hey! Grafted Scion, I'm probably gonna die. How do I, oh dear, oh dear. I'm, I'm, am I dead? Is that all? Even when you die, it's like very slow and methodical. Passing over your body. It's a very dramatic game. Everything in this game is very slow and dramatic. All right, I played Elden Ring, I died. Uh, I've experienced that this game is obviously meant for people who have a lot more time than I do these days. So I appreciate that. If you guys are playing Elden Ring and having a good time with it, let me know in the comment section down below. How about that? 
So now that we got all that stupid performance stuff out of the way, let's take a look at what you guys are really interested in, and that's RGB lighting configuration for this build. Now, now I knew I was gonna need two pieces of software to control the lighting here, which is uh, Corsair IQ, as well as Asus, either Aura Sync or Aura Creator. Aura Creator is a little bit fancier and allows you to do more things. And then I had to add one more piece of software, the G-Skill uh, RGB control software for their memory, because while the G-Skill memory can often be controlled by the Asus software, because it's newer memory, it's not being picked up there. Likewise, there was the potential for the Corsair IQ software to be able to control everything. I've got my lighting node core here uh, recognized and that's what all the fans are connected to. I do have the uh, Asus video card and the Asus motherboard recognized, but it's only generically recognizing them. So there is the potential in the future for a Corsair IQ update to be able to specifically recognize some of this Asus hardware and have a little bit better control over that. Or there are third party RGB software solutions now like OpenRGB and Signal RGB. I haven't dabbled with those too much. So I'll save that for a future video. Just trying to point out there's more than one way to skin this cat. But just to give you guys a demo of some of the potential, I wanted to respond to a few of the comments from the original build video. The first one here is from Amini and they're just saying, GPU RGB lines match up perfectly with the case lines. I'd say especially with the lines here on the graphics card, which are very, very visible since we're using a vertical mount, I'd say those do match very well with some of the lines on the case. And again, some of these parts were chosen before I knew I was even gonna use this case. So it was really sort of a happy coincidence that this all matched up so nicely. And even without much work here, just looking at sort of the standard RGB vomit configuration that most RGB lighting typically defaults to, everything's looking pretty nice and fairly well tied together even though, like I said, we're gonna have to use three different pieces of software to control this. I quickly turned off the lighting on the Corsair fans just to show you guys what's being controlled by what. So the G-Skill memory is being controlled by the G-Skill software. The RGB on the graphics card, these stripes right here, and there's a logo on the top too that you can't really see from this angle. As well as this accent at the top left on the motherboard, as well as the RGB on the pump block unit for the Deepcool Castle 360EX. That is plugged into one of the RGB headers on the motherboard, so that's being controlled by the ASUS software too. And then all six of these Corsair fans are being controlled by the Corsair uh, IQ software, and that allows us to really quickly demonstrate some of the features of there, like color shift that you can jump between. These are lighting link effects, which means it's controlling uh, the keyboard that I have connected as well. But if we go up to presets, there's actually a bunch more uh, that are available up here, and some that actually look pretty cool, like this is color warp. And when the fans are all either plugged in in order, or if you go over here to lighting setup, you can drag and drop them so that they're in the proper order from the red, yellow, green, blue, pink, and, and I guess light pink on there, uh, but you can ship those around if you need to. I just plugged them in properly from the get-go, so I didn't have to do that. I set all the other RGBs to white just so we can take a look at a few of these. Note that you can shift the direction on some of these. So this is doing a gate effect. So there's sort of a rotation around the outside of the fan, and then there's sort of a gate to the next fan. It goes from uh, one side of the fan to the other, shifting colors. This is ping, which is sort of like a visor effect, but you can sort of see it going across all of the fans. And again, just sort of the thing, like if, you t if you're gonna take the time to install all these RGB fans and plug them in the proper way and do all the cable management that's necessary, taking advantage of the fact that they can be individually addressed is just something that you might wanna do. So this is Pong. Uh, the ball is represented by the green and the paddles are represented by the red. So you can see a paddle appearing on either side side red and then the ball bounces back and forth green. There's quite a few different effects in here. I don't want to go through all of them, but just pointing out Corsair has done a lot of work with the IQ software. And if you can find a way to get this to sort of play nice with the rest of the RGBs in your system, if they're not all able to be addressed and controlled by IQ, then there's some pretty cool effects you can do. And of course you can save profiles for each one. So I, I thought I had saved an all white profile. Uh, if you go down to lighting type, custom static color, will let you do all whites. And one thing I want to point out here as well, when you're all whites uh, or if things are looking a little bright, you can also adjust this opacity capacity slider. This is something I noticed with my wife's all white PC that I built recently. It is so, so bright. So you can actually dim those LEDs a bit if you want and get it to be, you know, just maybe a little bit more subtle if that's your goal. But this is one of the configurations that I always like to test out, the all whites, and that's pretty much what it looks like. I do want to point out that the top left RGB accent on the motherboard has sort of a prismatic cover over it. So the reflection that you're seeing there that's showing kind of pink is only affected by the angle of the camera and it actually looks more white if you look at it more directly on rather than a little bit off center. But let's do some fan requested lighting configurations from Krabastian. Uh, 
Uh, he says, how about some purple and teal? Sort of like the purple, pink, teal 80s style. So for that, we can have sort of a purple, pink, uh, turquoise or teal, uh, kind of the 80s style lighting. So here's purple, pink, teal, and, and I guess a little white in there, and here's how I configured it. For the G-Skill software, I'm just using a static configuration, and this is actually the same uh, configuration I'll use for the blue that I'm gonna look at in just a minute. For IQ, I'm only controlling the lights on the lighting node core, so just for all of those fans, and I'm using two effects. Rotary stack on top, and that sort of does a rotation around each fan, and then changes the color at the end between these two colors that I've chosen, which again is sort of a teal and a purple. A limitation I've found with a lot of the RGB software where is, uh, and I'd say IQ in particular, is that you can only either do two colors that you choose, or you can go just to random RGB. I'd like to be able to select from like a, a gradient range, and I'll show you how the ASUS software can do that in just a second. That said, you can layer stuff, so I put the rotary stack on top, and then I did just a static color of pink, and that's sort of the background that those colors appear over, and again, I took advantage of the fact that you can adjust the opacity here, just to dial back that pink a little bit to make it blend in a little bit better. And then for our Aura Creator software. This software, like I said, is a bit more complex. You have to select all of the devices that you want it to control. Then you make a layer of those devices down here. And then it's got a timeline that you can add effects to. So you can actually have multiple effects sort of that happen one after another up to like a six minute cycle. Or if you just have a shorter thing like this, it will repeat. So I just chose rainbow from the effects over here and brought it down to the timeline. And this is what I really like about the ASUS software, gradient options. So you can have a nice smooth gradient with a range of colors that you choose that isn't necessarily just two colors. And if you start and end the gradient on the same color, then it will cycle quite nicely. And it went from pink to purple to teal. And so that's what's giving you that nice effect on the GPU, the uh, CPU water block, and the motherboard accent lighting. Next request from Rachel Marie says, she'd be real handsome in like a breathing blue light or a dark purple or blue vaporwave. So I already kind of did a vaporwave. So here's my light blue configuration. I once again went with a rainbow gradient on the Aura Creator software. For the G-Skill software, just sticking with that same uh, blue to white gradient that I already set up. And then in IQ, I'm once again using two layers, just a white, white static color on the bottom. And you can actually, if you go opacity zero on that, you can turn those off. And then you can see the ping effect that I did with sort of a darker blue and a lighter blue. And that's going across the top, down the side, and then it bounces and goes back Back up and across. So kind of a fancier version of visor is what that's looking like. And then if we turn that uh, background color up a little bit more, that gives us a little bit more fill in with the white. Uh, and that's my blue and white configuration. One more request from Infinite Dark Mass. I'd like to see a sunset RGB theme and know more about thermals. We already talked about thermals and testing and stuff earlier in the video. And does the case have filters at the bottom, which is something I left out of the build video. I'll show you that in just a second. Once again, with the G-Skill software, manually set up all eight LEDs on that with sort of a red to yellow gradient with some orange. ASUS software sticking with that rainbow yet again. And again, I just, at the gradient, I love being able to do a gradient. That's what I've been doing with my background PC for quite some time. And I just think it's a great solution. So I went from yellow to orange to red with that. And I slowed the speed down a bit just so we could get a nice peaceful sunset view. And then in IQ, I once again went with a couple layers, static orange for the background and then a sequential. And then this effect here is sequential or sequential one. If I turn off that background color, you can see how it sort of creeps across all of the fans. I wish it would go back the other direction rather than just resetting, but you know, maybe that's something Corsair could add in the future. Like I can switch the direction, but it'd be cool if it could start with them all lit up and then have them all go away. That would be a little bit more like sunset-like, I suppose. Or, you know, like I said, there's a bunch of other lighting effects here that could be applied over there to maybe go with some something that's a little bit more sunset-y, but I, I like this one. I feel like it's very, very peaceful. And yeah, I'd say it reminds me of a sunset to some degree. What do you guys think? And this is something that I legitimately should have included in the original build video, but I wanted to show you guys the bottom of this case. I had quite a few comments that this is a negative, fil uh, negative pressure setup inside the case, and that is true to some degree. But remember, there are two 120 millimeter intake fans pre-installed at the bottom. Those come with the case. I just left those installed. And yes, there is a dust filter down here that you can access without too much. You gotta turn the case on its side, but it's not too hard to remove or pop back on. And at this point, we are out of time for testing this system for the day. So hopefully you guys have gotten a much better idea of the performance of a 12700K. In particular, the cooling performance of this case when paired up with a couple all-in-one liquid cooling solutions, a 360 millimeter radiator solution for the top and a 240 millimeter radiator solution for the graphics card. 
I've received so many positive comments from you guys on the first video on how this system turned out. So thank you for that. And just a reminder that this wasn't really that well planned out from the get go. The graphics card just happens to match up with the lines and design of the Y60 case. So it all kind of fell in place for this being the build of the month for this month. But uh, thank you guys for all of your feedback on that. And again, a reminder to those of you who are located in the US or Canada, make sure you enter to win via the gleam.io link in the video's description. Also in the description, you can find links to all the parts for this build and although prices are fluctuating a bit right now generally speaking it's around forty five hundred to five thousand dollars for all of these pieces straight up which either is really expensive or maybe a sort of reasonable price if you're comparing it to like i don't know a fully upgraded mac studio or something right now while you're checking those links out though you can also leave me a comment in the comment section if you'd like to leave me a little bit more feedback on this system i'd love to hear that and don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video check out my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts mugs pint glasses and all sorts of high quality merchandise to help support my channel and get some high quality merch don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you're not already for more tech videos like this coming at you real soon including next month a new how to build a pc tutorial thanks again so much for watching everyone and we'll see you in the next video